Um, so today we're going to spend some time talking about uh, the genetics of dementia and many of the questions that commonly come up when people are thinking about having genetic counseling or when they are in a genetic counseling session. So I'm just leaving some terms up here um, that you might see throughout the presentation, but I'll try to use the full names of terms when uh, speaking about them. But here are some abbreviations you might see throughout the slides. Okay. So many of you have likely heard the um, phrase, dementia is like an umbrella. Dementia refers to broadly a group of conditions that cause people to have problems with things like memory, personality, reasoning, but there's many different subtypes of dementia that can have slightly different symptoms, that can have different underlying genetic causes or um, non-genetic causes, and can have differences in the pathology, which is what we see if somebody um, donates their brain after they're no longer living and has an autopsy where we can look at the brain under a microscope. So there can be differences in these subtypes of dementia, but there's also a lot of overlap between them, which is why we kind of consider this a broad umbrella term that covers a lot of different um, of subtypes. So one of the main questions that I'm asked is, is dementia genetic? So the simple answer is most often there's not one single cause for a person's dementia, one single genetic cause. But sometimes there is a single difference in a single gene that can cause dementia. For the vast majority of people, they fall into what we call multifactorial. This means there's more than one factor contributing to why they developed dementia. And this can be teeny tiny genetic risk factors that combine to cause risk but it also can be non-genetic things like environmental exposures, trauma, lifestyle factors, things that research is still um, really trying to figure out and understand. And right now for any one person, we're not really able to pinpoint what are those factors that definitely caused your dementia. You might have some good guesses, but it's hard to really prove for any one person what the exact cause is sometimes. Whether your dementia or your loved one's dementia is genetic can also depend on the subtype of, de of dementia. So some forms of dementia like frontotemporal dementia, for example, have a stronger genetic component or are more likely to have a genetic component than other forms like late onset Alzheimer's disease, for example. And so this is one of the reasons why it's really important to try to get an accurate diagnosis for a person with dementia. So many people come and say, oh, you know, my loved one's primary care physician said they probably have dementia, um, but it's really hard to then sometimes get that person to a neurologist or a cognitive neurologist for that matter to be able to make as accurate of a diagnosis as possible, but that really can help guide us in what we're thinking about in terms of what's the likelihood this is genetic. Um, the odds of something being genetic also depend on the family history. Is there anybody else in that family tree who had dementia or other related neurologic conditions? as well as the age of onset. So when did symptoms start? Was the person quite young? Like were they younger than 65 years old? Or were they in the more typical age of onset when we think about dementia, like older than 65? So all of these factors combined to, to be able to answer that question, is the dementia in my family genetic? And we'll talk about each of these things in turn throughout the presentation. To back up a second, I wanna define what am I talking about when I say genes, genetic, genetic testing? So if you think about the DNA code that tells our bodies what to do, it tells our, the cells in our bodies how to grow, divide, and function, the DNA code is made up of a bunch of genes. And we like to think of this as kind of like sentences that spell out to make an instruction code for those cells in our body. And so sometimes people will have a genetic difference, usually called a genetic variant, but sometimes referred to as a mutation. Um, where there's a, sort of like a typo in those sentences that tell the body what to do. And so the, an example that's on the screen here is if you change just one letter in the sentence, the hip and the leg, you all of a sudden are telling the body's cells to make the hip and the peg. So with even just one single difference in your DNA code, sometimes it can mess up the instructions for the body. And so in some cases, it can be a genetic variant that causes risk for dementia. When dementia is genetic, the vast majority of it does follow what we call an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. And those are some 
uh, some big words there, so I'll unpack that for a minute. Autosomal simply means that this can affect any sex. So it can be men, it can be women, it doesn't have to be um, only one sex is affected. And it also means it can be passed down by either sex. So a man can pass this to his daughter, a woman can pass this to her son. There's no sex relatedness here. When the word dominant is here, that means that of, of the two versions of that gene, only one of them needs to not work in order to cause symptoms. So we have two copies of pretty much every gene in our bodies. We get one from mom and one from dad, our biological parents. And if just one of those copies isn't working, that's enough to cause symptoms. What that dominant part also means is that every time a parent with that genetic variant has a child, they have a 50%, so a one in two chance of passing on that genetic difference to each child that they have. And you can see that in the diagram on the screen. So now that we know that sometimes dementia can be genetic, many people ask, well, how can I find out if the dementia in my family in particular is genetic? And so I wanna spend some time talking about genetic counseling and testing. Many of you may have never heard of genetic counseling. Um, not every neurology team has a genetic counselor on staff. At Penn, we are really lucky to have five genetic counselors in our neurology group. Genetic counseling is really a process where the provider, so the genetic counselor and the family partner to um, make sure that the family is comfortable with all the genetic information that's relevant to them. And that involves um, helping people understand the medical and psychological implications of this condition, both for the person diagnosed in the family, but also for other family members who might be considered at risk. And so as part of this process, a genetic counselor will gather a family history and they'll use that to help inform a risk assessment, to help us figure out what are the odds that the condition in the family could be genetic. And that can help us figure out not only what's the chance that the person's condition is genetic, but also what are the odds that this could pop up in other family members? What's the inheritance pattern? So we spend some time talking about um, things like inheritance, testing options, any sort of uh, management implications that a genetic finding could have. You know, are there trials or treatments available? Um, and connecting people to the right resources. But a big thing I want to emphasize is that in our name, we are genetic counselors counseling is a big part of what we do. And so we're really here to help guide you through the process from an education standpoint, but also to help you adjust to the losses you might be experiencing in your family or um, the other emotions that might be uh, at play here. And so it can be a lot to adapt to living with a family member with dementia or to be the one living with dementia. And so I wanna emphasize that genetic counseling is not the same thing as just having genetic testing. You can absolutely see a genetic counselor and decide not to have any genetic testing done for you or your loved one. So counseling is really a process. Our goal is not to convince you to test. Our goal is to give you the information and support you need to be able to make the best decision for you and for your family. So who should have a genetic counseling appointment? Basically, anybody who has questions about genetics or could benefit from, from speaking with a, a counselor regardless of whether they know they want to test or not. So many people seek information and coping resources just as much as they do testing or test results. So again, genetic counseling does not have to mean having genetic testing. Also, sometimes people could have had genetic testing done a long time ago and might not have had the chance to meet with a genetic counselor, or they might have, but they might want a refresher to touch base and, and get some counseling. And so that's perfectly reasonable as well. When I talk about genetic testing, I like to think of it in two different buckets. The first bucket is diagnostic genetic testing. And that's what uh, diagnostic testing refers to when a person already has a, a condition. So a person has dementia and we're doing genetic testing to try to figure out a reason for why those symptoms have developed. So that's bucket number one. Bucket number two is predictive genetic testing. That is when somebody doesn't have any symptoms, don't have, they don't have a diagnosis of dementia, but they might have a family history of dementia and they want to know, even though I don't have symptoms now, am I at risk for developing symptoms in the future based on my family history? So we're gonna start with diagnostic genetic testing. Again, this is determining whether a cause can be found for why a person has developed a dementia or whatever condition they have. 
So sometimes people ask, I've already got this clinical diagnosis or my loved one's already got this clinical diagnosis of dementia. What's the point? What could I possibly get out of doing another test? What's this gonna tell me? And so people have different stances as to whether or not this feels valuable to them, but I'll walk you through some of the types of information that you can get from genetic testing in this type of uh, circumstance. So for some people, they just have this question of why has this happened to me or to my loved one? Why have they developed dementia? Especially when this sometimes strikes out of the blue, there was no known family history or they were very young. Sometimes just that question of why is this happening is something that people feel the need to try to pursue anything they can to get that answer. And so sometimes if we do genetic testing, we can find an answer for why disease has developed and that can be a relief for some people. It can also alleviate feelings of guilt um, or misconceptions about other things that might have happened in someone's life to cause disease. So, for example, I've had families who thought that um, a person's car accident that resulted in head trauma was the only reason they went on to develop dementia and the driver felt really guilty. Well, when they found out that the loved one actually had a really strong genetic risk factor to develop dementia in the first place, um, you know, it made them feel a little bit less bad about that incident. Sometimes getting a genetic diagnosis can also uh, make it for a more accurate diagnosis. So for example, if someone had Alzheimer's versus frontotemporal dementia from our clinical standpoint, because like sometimes they can be hard to distinguish. If a genetic difference is found in an FTD related gene, it can give more weight to the diagnosis being FTD, even though that's still a diagnosis that's made clinically. Sometimes that can help even save money because it can avoid having to do additional workups, more imaging, more um, things like lumbar punctures, although some of those things might still be clinically indicated. Sometimes a genetic cause can help people anticipate other medical needs they might have in the future. So for example, some of the genes that can cause dementia can also cause other neurologic symptoms like Parkinson's-like symptoms, or ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, for example. So it wouldn't be a guarantee that those other symptoms would definitely develop, but it could help us know what to keep an eye out for. Sometimes it can help also get an understanding of prognosis. Do people with this genetic variant tend to have rapid progression or not? What's been really exciting is that sometimes a genetic diagnosis can lead to the potential to treat or enrollment in clinical trials. This is a rapidly advancing space in the dementia world. Furthermore, uh, sometimes a genetic diagnosis can help people make different reproductive planning decisions. You know, do they want to go through alternative methods of reproduction to avoid passing down a genetic variant found in the family? As mentioned before, it does provide information to family members in terms of what's their risk, and then they can consider whether predictive genetic counseling and testing is something they want to pursue. So these are some uh, core examples of reasons that come up quite frequently for people thinking about diagnostic genetic testing, but every family comes at this from a different perspective and the genetic counselor would explore your goals with you. Genetic testing for dementia can happen in a variety of different ways. I'm gonna share with you a little bit about our approach that we tend to take for, um, at Penn. So typically we start with a focused look at genes that we know can cause dementia. And so sometimes we can send what's called a panel that looks at a bunch of genes at the same time that we know have been associated with various forms of dementia. But some genes require special separate testing that can't be done where we look at a bunch at the same time. And one of the really important genes in dementia is like that. It's called C9ORF72, which you might hear called C9 for short. And that's the type of gene that gets too big compared to what it's supposed to be. It's called a repeat expansion. So if you think back to what I told you about um, the genes and the genetic code being sort of like an instruction manual, instead of a single, single letter change, like we said, the hip and the leg versus the hip and the peg, this would be like the body saying the hip, 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 and the leg. So it's getting too big. It's making the instructions not uh, work the way they're supposed to. And that requires a special, separate, unique test. Sometimes if people start with this focused testing and it doesn't give them an answer and they're, they have a strong family history or they're motivated to gather more information, we can consider broader testing called exome or genome sequencing that looks at pretty much the whole DNA code. This can be helpful as a tool for the future because as new genes are described over time as being associated with dementia, we can go back and look at the sequencing data. What is that spelling code of your genes? Because we've looked at pretty much the whole DNA code. Sometimes if people don't wanna do genetic testing while the person is living, 
or if they've done testing and haven't found an answer and they wanna make sure a sample is available in the future, even if the loved one with dementia is no longer living, they'll consider something called DNA banking. This is where a lab can store a person's DNA for many years, usually for a one-time cost. Um, one of the key labs doing it right now is prevention genetics. I think it's about $160 or $170 right now for a one-time fee for them to store the DNA for at least the next 50 or so years. And that way, if in the future, genetic testing uh, is something the family desires, you know you have sample available. And that's something that can be ordered by the family. Whereas those other tests, the genetic tests themselves are ordered by a genetic counselor or other clinician with genetics expertise. The way results can come back typically fall into three different buckets. The first is positive. That's where we say, okay, we found a genetic difference that explains why you've developed dementia. And that allows for all those things I talked about in terms of why people pursue genetic testing in the first place. If results come back negative or normal, this means that a genetic cause of your condition was not identified. It doesn't mean that you don't have that condition. It just means that we haven't found a genetic cause. Usually this doesn't result in any changes to medical management, but this is individual and would need to be discussed with the clinician. Um, and sometimes results can come back uncertain. And this means we found a difference in the DNA code, but we don't have enough proof to say, is that genetic difference actually causing the symptoms? Or could it be normal variation? Like we all have differences in our DNA code and some of them don't cause any problems at all. And so this would be up to the clinicians to do their homework. They have to do some research and figure out what they think about that variant. They would communicate that with you. And normally we just sort of follow them over time. And as more research is done, sometimes they get reclassified as either disease causing or pathogenic or benign or normal. Sometimes there's some follow-up testing we can do within a family to help clarify the variant's role in disease, but that's not always the case. Now we're gonna move from the first bucket of diagnostic testing, which we've been talking about, where we're testing a person who does have symptoms to go to the second bucket of testing, which I call predictive genetic testing. And again, that is testing of a person that does not have any symptoms or diagnosis, but is at risk of potentially having symptoms based on their family history. As you can imagine, this is a highly personal choice, whether you want to know, do I have this risk? It should only be um, performed in the context of genetic counseling because there's a lot of emotional and practical considerations that really need to be thought through before testing is pursued. And it should be only performed um, in a lab that is what we call CLIA certified, which just means it's a federally regulated lab. It's a clinical grade test. And some research studies do offer this type of testing, but all clinical testing would be this type. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about clinic versus research later on in the presentation. Whenever possible, it's best to start in a family by doing the diagnostic genetic testing that we were talking about before. Because if we can figure out the cause of someone's dementia in the family, then other relatives can have much more straightforward testing where we look just for the particular variant that we know is causing disease in the family. And you can get a yes or a no answer as to did you inherit the risk in the family or not. If the person with uh, dementia in the family doesn't have genetic testing, the person with uh, wanting to know their risk still can pursue genetic testing. Uh, it just makes it harder to interpret the results and a genetic counselor can help navigate that um, for your personal situation since it really varies based on the family uh, tree. Um, so again, this is a highly personal choice that should be made in the context of genetic counseling. Sometimes people will consider um, an evaluation with a neurologist if they have concern for symptoms when they're trying to figure out their risk. And sometimes people will find it beneficial to meet with a psychiatrist just to make sure that they're in the right headspace to get this type of information either way, but a genetic counselor can also perform a mental health assessment. So why would somebody think about genetic testing if they don't have any symptoms themselves? You know, some people say to me, I absolutely do not wanna know. This would derail my life if it came back positive and I found out I have this risk, I wouldn't be able to move forward day to day. It would, it would be a, such an emotional burden for me. It would be so stressful. And I absolutely can't get this testing done. And that is fine. Nobody will ever tell you that you have to have genetic testing if you don't have symptoms. Um, even if you do have symptoms, genetic testing is always optional. But some people have the complete opposite reaction and feel in order to be able to move forward with my life, I have to know if I have this risk or not because I'm so worried about it and it's keeping me from moving forward. And so 
for some genetic forms of, of um, dementia, there are things you can do if you know you have a, a genetic risk in terms of taking action from a clinical perspective. So there are some trials going on that, again, are just research. They're not clinical care, but there are some clinical trials going on where if you know you have a genetic difference that's putting you at risk for a certain type of dementia, you can join the trial to try to prevent or slow onset of disease. Right now in the FTD world, there is a GRN, so a progranulin trial going on. So that's one example. Not every genetic form of dementia has this type of trial available right now. The goal is that one day we will get there and to actually even have FDA approved treatments that we can initiate, not just trials. Um, but besides you know, the potential to treat, there are other reasons that people feel they need this information. So for example, some people say, I'm gonna make different decisions about my family planning if I find out I'm at risk. You know, maybe I don't wanna have kids at all because I don't wanna be a parent that develops these neurologic symptoms and then my kids have to watch me go through this. Some people say, I wanna have kids, but I really wanna make sure I don't pass down this risk. So I'm gonna go through several different, um, you know, reproductive pathways that exist that I'm happy to answer um, questions about if people are interested in that, um, you know, to avoid passing down a genetic variant in the family. And some people say, I'm gonna have kids the regular old way and hope that the science catches up by the time they would be at risk. And all of those are okay decisions. It's highly personal, but sometimes the genetics can help inform people's reproductive planning. Um, sometimes people use this to make different decisions about their life planning. Like, do I wanna be in this career if I know I might have to um, retire early? Do I want to be living near family? Do I want um, to you know, change my plans for retirement? So people use this to inform all different sorts of things in their lives. Some people um, find out they might have risk and already have children and they wanna be able to provide information to their kids. Um, but also it's important to think about how would this information impact your relationships? What if I wanna know my status, but my siblings don't, even though my status doesn't have any implication for their status because we each have our own uh, independent risk, how am I gonna feel if they tell me they don't wanna know my results? How am I gonna feel if my loved one or, or significant other doesn't want me to find out and I wanna know? And these are things a genetic counselor can help you think through as well. But um, what's really, really important um, are two things. One is thinking about how emotionally you might handle this news. Um, you know, are you going to be able to have the coping strategies to deal with a result, whether it's positive and you need to adjust to life knowing you might have this risk or whether it's negative and you don't have risk for dementia, but you might be feeling something like what we call survivor's guilt, where if a sibling tests positive and you test negative and you feel bad that they're going to have this experience that you're not going to. So there's all sorts of emotional things that get wrapped up in this, regardless of how the results come back. And the other important thing to think about is practical considerations with things like insurance discrimination. I believe I have a slide dedicated to this next. Yes. So um, there is a law out there called GINA, which stands for the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, that says that in most cases, your health insurance and your employer cannot ask for or use your genetic information against you in any way. So they can't fire you, they can't not promote you, they can't not hire you, they can't drop your health insurance coverage because they find out that you're at risk for dementia. And so some exceptions are if you work for the military, the federal government, or an employer with less than 15 employees, then sometimes medical information, including genetics, can be requested. But in the vast majority of cases, GINA applies to protect you against discrimination from your health insurance and your employer. But the reason we bring up these protections in the first place is actually to point out their limitations, which is that this law does not provide the same protections for life insurance, long-term care insurance, or disability insurance. So if you were found to have genetic risk for dementia, and then you went to apply for a new life, long-term care, or disability insurance policy, they could deny you coverage or charge you a high premium when they request medical information and see that you have this risk. So what we encourage people to do is think really carefully about what life, long-term care, and disability insurances they might want someday and get those in place before they have any of this type of information in their medical chart. Because once you have uh, those types of policies, they can't be taken away. Um, sometimes people will also think about research participation, which I'll, again, I'll get to in a little bit later, because then your information's in a research chart, not your medical record, which is one little added layer of protection 
but still, um, you know, if insurance companies ask you specifically if you've had genetic testing, you can't commit insurance fraud, you have to tell the truth. So it's important to think about what insurances you have and what you might want someday before thinking about pursuing predictive genetic testing. So I've alluded to this a few times of this sort of pathways for accessing genetic counseling and testing. There's two main pathways, the clinical route and the research route. The clinical route is the sort of traditional way of accessing counseling and testing. You meet with a genetic counselor, just like you'd meet with any other healthcare provider, where it can be in person or sometimes in some states via telehealth, so through video visit. You talk about all the sorts of things that are important to talk through before making a decision about testing. This is regardless of whether we're talking diagnostic or predictive. Um, and then if you decide to move forward with testing, the testing usually is usually done on um, blood or a cheek swab. It goes out to a lab. The results come back to the um, ordering provider, whether, whether that's a genetic counselor or a physician. And then you can choose you know, to have the results returned to you uh, by that provider. The cost goes to your insurance. Insurance usually covers things pretty well and there's options for self-pay if not. And the results are stored in your medical record just like any other um, medical testing you have done. On the research side, it can vary from um, protocol to protocol what is available. Um, I'll give you an example of the all FTD study at Penn, um, which is a site, it's a, it's a study that has sites throughout the country. Penn is one of them, but the all FTD, the ALL FTD study has the option for genetic counseling and testing as part of it. And so just like in the clinical uh, realm, you meet with a genetic counselor, you talk about whether you wanna move forward with testing and I'll explore all the emotional and practical considerations, again, regardless of whether diagnostic or predictive. And then if you decide you wanna move forward, the results come back to the study team and you can choose to learn the results. The cost goes to the researcher, not to you or your insurance, and the results are in the research record, not the medical chart. This can vary in different studies. Some studies, the results aren't able to be returned to you. They're just done in a research lab, not a CLIA certified federally regulated lab. And sometimes some institutions might have integration between their research records and their medical charts. So it's really important to ask questions about these things when you're joining a research protocol. So during the consent process, or if you're already a participant, you can always ask your study team. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about the research options we have at Penn. I don't know um, as much about other sites protocols, but I'm happy to, to try to answer questions. Some questions we get about the logistics of testing. Um, what type of sample do we need? So it's really something we can do on blood, cheek swab, or saliva, so spit. Um, buckle is another fancy word you might hear for a cheek swab. It's not something that you need anything more invasive for, so it does not require things like a lumbar puncture or anything like that. Result turnaround time depends on what test is being ordered, whether it's being done clinically or through a research study and what that protocol would be. Um, and um, so what type of testing, what lab, and whether it's clinical or research. And so the vast majority of tests, I would say, are about a four-week turnaround time. If you do the broad genetic tests, those can take about four months to come back. So those are things like exome or genome sequencing. And again, with research, it's important to ask questions about this when joining. So some studies will say, you know, you'll get results back in four weeks, but some studies will say, you may never get results back or we'll notify you at some point in years from now if we find something. So pay attention during the consent process. In terms of cost of testing, um, again, this varies based on the type of test being ordered in the lab and um, uh, the, genetic counselor or um, other clinician can walk you through this, but often the cost of testing is pretty well covered by insurance these days. For many people, it's zero dollars out of pocket. They have no copay. Sometimes there is a copay, but um, there's often self-pay rates from these labs. And typically the testing costs for self-pay are somewhere on the order of two to $300 at most. Um, in research, the cost of testing is often covered by the study. So now back to this question, now that we've, we've gone through what is genetic, uh, what are genetics, what's genetic counseling, what's genetic testing, and how do I go about accessing these things? Let's come back to this question of what's the likelihood of developing these conditions in the first place? So about 10 to 12% of people in the general population will develop some form of dementia at some point in their lifetime. That's the baseline general population risk. 
but your odds of developing dementia depend on the type of dementia in your family, again, as well as the age of onset, so how old were they when symptoms started, and family history. Are there any other people in the family tree who've had dementia or related conditions like Parkinson's and ALS? There are both protective factors and risk factors as well. And I'm going to go through two examples of types of dementia with um, these specifics in mind. First, we'll do Alzheimer's, and then we'll talk about FTD. So Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. And um, typically, when people think about Alzheimer's, they think about changes in memory, um, but can also lead to things like changes in personality and behavior. Um, it is among the leading causes of death in America. And unfortunately, right now, there's no cure but there are a lot of advances going on in treatment and care right now. The vast majority of people with Alzheimer's have what we consider the typical or late onset form, which is when symptoms start older than 65 years old. The greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's is actually age. Our risk for developing this increases as we get older. Most people with Alzheimer's do not have a single genetic explanation for why they've developed Alzheimer's but they can have some genetic risk factors that combined with other factors could have put them at higher risk to develop this. So like I said, age is considered a risk factor. There are also risk factors like other medical conditions like cardiovascular disease or diabetes that you can work with your doctor to keep under control. There are some things just like age, you can't control your age. I wish we could stop time, but we can't. Um, you also can't control your family history. You can't control what other people in your family tree have developed. Um, you can't control what genetic factors you've inherited. Um, and there are things you can minimize risk for, like traumatic brain injury. But I also like to think about Alzheimer's risk in terms of what are some of the protective factors? What can we do to try to you know, keep our brains healthy? And so there are many things we can do, including um, making sure we do uh, good exercise, eating well, uh, making sure we have social interaction and keeping our brains cognitively stimulated, getting good sleep, Minimizing other health uh, risk factors, like uh, making sure your blood pressure is in check, for example. And so it's important to talk with your clinician to see if there's other things you can be doing to, to help with your brain health. When we think about genetic forms of Alzheimer's, the most likely uh, situ situation when a person would have a genetic cause for their Alzheimer's is when someone has early onset, so onset younger than 65, and has strong family history. So there's more than one person in the family tree who's developed this. When that is the situation, um, the odds are slightly higher of finding a genetic cause, but there are still many people with young onset Alzheimer's, sometimes even with family history, where we can't pinpoint a genetic cause. And that might be because there's new genes out there that we just haven't linked to Alzheimer's yet. Or it also could be that um, there's risk combining. It's a genetic cause plus something else that we haven't yet been able to, to well describe. And so there's three main genes that are currently implicated in early onset Alzheimer's. And these are ATP, PSEN1, and PSEN2. But again, these, com these combined account for a small percentage of all cases of people with Alzheimer's disease. When we think about late onset or typical onset Alzheimer's, again, this is the vast majority of people with Alzheimer's, people who had symptoms starting older than 65. Most of these people do not have one single genetic difference that is the sole cause of their Alzheimer's. It's often what we call multifactorial, which again means there's multiple factors contributing to why symptoms have developed in the first place. Age is the largest risk factor. That baseline population risk, again, 10 to 12 or 10 to 15%. And your odds of developing this sort of typical late onset Alzheimer's increase uh, when you have an affected first degree relative. So that's a parent, a sibling, or child. There is also one um, well described genetic risk factor for this late onset form of Alzheimer's, and that's the E4 version of the APOE, so the APOE gene. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking about APOE. I know it's been in the spotlight a little bit recently with um, Chris Hemsworth announcement that he has uh, the E4 allele. And um, it's also one of the genes that sometimes people end up accidentally getting results from when they order testing at home. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about that. So, so one of the questions I get all the time is 23andMe or some other at home test that I got in my, 
you know, Christmas gifts or I got for um, some sort of holiday, they told me I've got the Alzheimer's gene. Does that mean I'm definitely going to get Alzheimer's? The answer is no. And I wanna talk about that in a little bit more detail. So APOE, like I said before, has been found as a risk factor for Alzheimer's. The APOE gene comes in three different alleles or sort of forms, if you will. There's E2, E3, and E4. Those forms are all throughout the population. We all have two copies of the APOE gene, so we all have two of these forms. So someone can have E2, 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 E3, E2, E4, and so on and so forth, any combination of these three forms. The E4 version of this, the E4 allele, has been in the spotlight for Alzheimer's because having one or two copies of the E4 allele has been found to increase risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. But having one or two copies of the E4 version of the APOE gene does not mean you will definitely develop Alzheimer's. Having one copy increases your risk about two to three times as much as the general population, as you can see in the figure here. And having two copies increases your risk even more, but it's still not a complete 100% chance of developing Alzheimer's. There are many people with Alzheimer's who don't have one or two copies of the E4 version. And there are many people with one or two copies of the E4 version of this gene who never go on to develop Alzheimer's. So because of that, this is just considered a risk factor variant. It is in itself not what we think as sufficient to cause disease. There are other um, conditions that have been linked to different variants in the APOE gene, including some cardiovascular conditions um, and um, things like poor reaction or poor recovery from concussion, for example. Um, but we're gonna focus on its relationship to Alzheimer's. So again, APOE is just a risk factor. Um, whether your risk is increased, uh, the, the extent of that depends on whether you're found to have one or two copies of E4. There's also some research that suggests that the E2 version of that could be protective. So it also depends what, what your other allele copy is. There's also research to suggest that this could depend on your ethnic background. It might be um, more of a risk factor in the white population than in the non-white population. And so our understanding of the APOE risk is still very much evolving. We also need to think about family history. If you've had genetic testing for something like 23andMe and you're found to have um, you know, the APOE one copy of E4, but you've got a really strong family history of everyone developing Alzheimer's in their 40s and 50s, you might not have had the appropriate testing. You might need a, to have evaluation for genes like APP, PSEN1, and PSEN2 to fully characterize your risk. And that's why it's so important to meet with a genetic counselor, which is often not available as part of these at-home tests. So ask your physician if you can meet with a genetic counselor if you have questions about these sorts of things. Um, currently, the uh, established guidelines for genetic counseling do not recommend people who don't have any symptoms think about having testing for APOE to see if they have risk. And that's because it's just a risk factor. There's not great clinical utility at this point. There's nothing we would do differently to intervene if you were found to have one or two copies of E4 and didn't have any symptoms. Um, so this is typically not offered clinically, but it's something that you can absolutely speak with a genetic counselor about. And if you felt really passionately about pursuing it, a genetic counselor would be able to order it for you. Um, so, Again, um, I just mentioned that the, you know, the APOE testing is not recommended for asymptomatic individuals at this time, but a person might still feel that it has personal utility. This has value to me. Knowing this information might make me you know, eat healthier or exercise more because I know I have this risk. So even though there's not clinical utility at this time, it wouldn't change management or reproductive decisions for an asymptomatic person. If you have personal utility or use for this, we can consider the testing. But I do want to give a plug that utility is evolving from the clinical perspective. Um, many of you have probably heard of the, the drug lecanemab that's been recently approved. Um, that is a drug where APOE testing might be something that people consider if they have mild cognitive impairment and are thinking about taking lecanemab. And that's because in some of the studies that were done for that drug, people were found to have increased risk of side effects of adverse reactions if they had one or two copies of the E4 version of APOE. And so if you are 
you or your loved one has mild cognitive impairment and you're thinking about taking lecanemab, it's important to ask your neurologist if they will consider ordering APOE testing or letting you meet with a genetic counselor to consider this because it might weigh into your decision-making about taking that drug because it can change the risk-benefit um, analysis that you might do in your head before making a decision. I'm now going to switch gears and talk a little bit about a different condition, frontotemporal degeneration or FTD. And FTD comes in a bunch of different variants. Uh, or um, So one is the behavioral variant, and that is the one that is the most likely to have a genetic underpinning. And that is typically characterized by drastic changes in behavior personality. Um, so people can go from being really outgoing to really shy and reserved and perhaps apathetic, you know, unwilling to engage in activities that used to make them happy. They can also go from really reserved to really outgoing and might be, have a hard time controlling their impulses. So um, they might make bad decisions like shoplift when they have money in their pocket or um, all of a sudden start making a bunch of purchases that they wouldn't normally make and drain their bank accounts. Um, they might be able to not control their sexual impulses and can get in trouble with that. There's a lot of different symptoms that can pop up, but those are just a few examples. There's also language variants um, or the aphasias. And this can be trouble putting words together um, in, a, in a way that makes sense. So you can have people trying to speak and the sentences just don't make sense. You can have people having a hard time understanding the meaning of words. Again, there's a lot of variance even within the language forms of this condition. And sometimes people can develop both behavioral and language symptoms. There's also a strong overlap between FTD and ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So some of the genes that can cause FTD can cause ALS as well. There's also overlap with Parkinson's. And um, again, sometimes there can be a hard time to clinically distinguish FTD from Alzheimer's because the symptoms can have overlap. So I just mentioned that there's overlap between FTD and ALS. There's a growing understanding that clinically we are seeing people with um, symptoms of both conditions. From a genetic perspective, the same genetic difference can cause FTD or ALS or both in the same person or the same family, depending on the gene. Um, and from a pathology perspective, there's some shared pathology there. So for example, TDP43 is the pathology in, in some people with FTD and some people with ALS. Some of the most common genetic causes that pop up in FTD are the C9RF72 repeat expansion that I talked about a little before, the GRN gene or progranulin, so variants in that gene, and the MAP tau gene or tau, so variants in that gene. And so these three genes are the most common genetic causes of FTD, but there are many more genes that have been described that can be related. And there's some information on the slide here about each of these individually. And again, we talked throughout this presentation about family history having some sort of um, implication in terms of what are the odds that this could be genetic. And so if you have um, a person with FTD or ALS or Alzheimer's has a family history of these other conditions, ALS, Parkinson's, et cetera, the odds of finding a genetic cause are much higher than if the person is what we call apparently sporadic, meaning they have no known family history. But Family history is a um, incomplete tool. It's a starting point. Sometimes people die young of other causes. So who knows if they would have gone on to develop disease if they had lived longer. Sometimes people might have symptoms but never make it to the right doctor or get the right diagnosis. I'm sure many of you on the call can relate to that. You know, sometimes FTD can take three to five years to get the right diagnosis. Um, sometimes people might have the right diagnosis but the family's not in great communication or health information is not shared. So um, there are many reasons why family history is a starting point, but it's not complete. And so even people with no known family history still can have a genetic form. It's just the odds are much higher if there is known family history. So sometimes people ask me, all right, so 23andMe and these other home tests have one of the Alzheimer's genes, but can it tell me about FTD gene? The answer is no. And if you ask, what if I get my raw data from these companies and run it through a third party company? Please don't do that. <laughs> there are so, 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 so many limitations. The type of testing that these at home testing companies do is not the same as a clinical grade test that you would get from a genetic counselor or neurologist. So if you want to know about your risk or um, 
your loved one who has a diagnosis wants to know about the cause of their condition for, for a dementia, please consult with your medical team. Please do not just try to figure it out through ordering these at-home tests because the technology isn't the same. It's not as good. It's not regulated. And there are so many published studies showing inconsistencies between what you might find from an at-home test and what you might find if you actually have a clinical grade test. Um, so they are not reliable for this type of medical testing. Another question that I get all the time is, what is this whole sporadic versus familial versus genetic thing? I personally hate the word sporadic because it's used by different people to mean different things. Some people, when they say sporadic, mean there's no other family history. But I already told you, family history is a limited tool. You know, there could have been family history that just wasn't known about. And someone always has to be the first person in the family diagnosed. You know, I've had, for example, identical twins where the first person develops um, a condition and they're told, oh, it looks like it's sporadic because there's no known family history. And later their sibling develops it. Well, it's no longer sporadic, but they were just the first one in the family diagnosed. And some people use the word sporadic to mean not genetic, but what type of testing was done? Was it complete? So um, broadly, I like to use the term apparently sporadic, meaning it appears to be not a genetic form. Familial means more than one person in the family has the same or related condition. Familial often makes it more likely that there's a genetic component, but there are some people with familial disease, so there's more than one person affected, where we still can't pinpoint a specific genetic cause at this time. The symptoms in someone with apparently sporadic or familial disease can be largely the same, so that doesn't really help us distinguish it. Sometimes if there's an autopsy done, it can help us, you know, think, oh, this looks like it could have a genetic component based on some of the things the neuropathologist can see on the slides. But many of the findings can be seen whether there's a genetic cause or not. And not all autopsies include genetic analysis as part of them. And not all autopsies allow for families to get a report with that information. And I already gave you my soapbox about family history. So what if my family doesn't have a known genetic cause for the dementia? So like I said before, it's very likely that we will continue to discover new, um, new gene disease associations. So more genes will likely be linked to Alzheimer's or FTD or other forms of dementia in the future. We're always making advances. So it's very important to stay in touch with your neurologist or genetic counselor. And it's very, very, very important that you do keep track of your family members' genetic test reports um, so that as you meet with providers over time and as family members need access to this over time, we know what's already been completed. Like I mentioned um, when I talked about testing options, if a genetic cause hasn't been found in your family, um, people can think about broad testing like exome or genome sequencing for a person with a diagnosis. And they can think about DNA banking for someone who's developed the disease so that uh, family members know that they have access to uh, that sample over time in the future. And like I said, you can always request to meet with a genetic counselor to have these questions answered. Sometimes um, someone in the family, like a parent, for example, will have dementia and either no genetic cause was able to be found on testing or they passed away before testing could be done or they've said, I absolutely don't want to be tested. Sometimes that family member will still wanna know their risk and they ask, well, can I and should I get tested even if we don't know the cause um, in the family? So again, I take this back to what is the type of dementia in the family? Some of them have a stronger genetic component, age of onset, family history, as we've been talking about. So um, broad testing, yes, is available, regardless of the type of dementia in the family, but, the odds of that testing finding something depends on all those things I just mentioned. And the problem is that if we don't know the cause of disease in the family, if someone's got you know, some form of dementia, whatever the condition is, if we test you broadly for genes that we know are associated with dementia, it can either come back positive and we say, okay, yes, you have risk. It can come back uncertain and we say, we don't really know what to make of this because we don't have anyone with the condition to test to clarify it. Or it can come back negative or normal but that negative isn't a true negative. That negative could either mean that someone in the family who had dementia had a genetic form and you just didn't inherit it because we looked in the right spot, or it could mean that person in the family might've had a genetic form, but it might've been one of those newer genes that we haven't even discovered yet. And therefore we didn't test you in the right place. 
And so your result's negative, but we didn't actually rule out your risk. You, you just, we didn't test you for the right thing. Or your loved one could have just had dementia, but not had a single genetic cause, and we just wouldn't be able to prove it. So um, testing without knowing the cause of the condition in the family is possible. It's just really hard to interpret results and might not be able to give you the reassurance that you're looking for with a normal result. So again, really important to talk through that with a genetic counselor. And we would walk through like, what are your goals? How would you use this information? What would this change for you? And also you need to think about the family. Um, if you get genetic testing, is that gonna automatically reveal anyone else's genetic status? So for example, um, you know, if a person in the family um, has dementia and their child really wants to know their genetic status, but the person with dementia doesn't want to test, well, if the child gets tested and founds they have a genetic form, that automatically reveals that that's probably what the parent has too. And also then, you know, their siblings would be considered to be at risk as well. So uh, there's a lot of family dynamics to consider before pursuing this. Sometimes, um, you know, you've made it through this whole journey of getting you or your loved one the right diagnosis, and it can be years, it can be a roller coaster of emotions, it can be way too many providers that you had to see to be able to get this diagnosis. And then pursuing a genetic diagnosis can feel like you're starting a whole new journey, you're getting on a whole new roller coaster. It can be, you know, an answer to why, it, it, can, it can give you that relief and understanding, but it can also, you know, throw you into feelings of anger. Like, why did this have, have to happen to us? This is unfair. Um, it can be, you know, making you feel sad, like experiencing this as a loss, grieving this new diagnosis. Um, but it can also give you a sense of control and, you know, the ability to plan. But then you get down that roller coaster and then it's, well, what do I have to communicate to the family? And that can lead to fear and stress, but again, can then empower family members to have that control and planning. So, this can be a roller coaster, and that's why it's really important to do this with the help of a provider. So I want to just wrap up with a few key summary points here, and then I'm really looking forward to answering any questions that have come up. Um, so the vast majority of dementias do not have a single genetic cause for most people who develop them. Um, in the FTD spectrum, uh, C9, GRN, and MAPT are the three most common genes. Whereas APP, PSEN1, and PSEN2 are the three most common for early onset Alzheimer's, with APOE, E4 being the most common risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's. Having a family history of other people with neurologic conditions increases the chances of finding a genetic cause, but you can still have a genetic form of the condition even with no fit known family history. Genetic testing is available, genetic counseling is available, even if you don't want testing. And whenever possible, it's best to start genetic testing in a family with someone who has the diagnosis. Please, 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 please talk with a genetic counselor if you have questions, you need support, even if you know you don't wanna test. And again, genetic counseling is not the same thing as genetic testing. So thank you so much for um, your time and your attention. Um, I have some resources here that I'll leave up um, for a few moments. And I'm looking forward to Nelson giving me some questions from the chat.